Hello there, this is Arun Gupta from DevOps Belgium. I'm very excited to be here with Anna Maria. Hey Arun, I'm very happy to be here, being interviewed by you, it's an honor. Absolutely, a pleasure as well. So what do you do, Anna? So, uh, by day, I am a technical lead at IBM. Uh, this is my daily job. Um, and I am coding like many of us. Um, I am trying to experiment as much as possible, and I'm learning new things. I'm passionate about Java frameworks, about Kubernetes, about Helm, and well, uh, getting certifications, recently got certified on OpenShift, so all the time learning new stuff. Very cool, very cool. So your talk, as I understand, is about troubleshooting containerized applications. Mm -hmm. As we are building these containerized applications, you know, the day one is good, but day two, when the app doesn't work as expected, is what makes it tricky. Yeah. So tell me more about your talk. So I'm talking about uh, things that are noticed when the um, application evolves, mostly, or when you are running into situations. So I'm talking about health <coughs> checks. You can, you can go into the wrong side also when you're making health checks. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to give some practical examples and the, do, the goods and not so good stuff about that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about images and how you can you know, replace images, um, regardless if it's the uh, tag problem or it's not the tag problem. I mean, I've seen a, a, a lot of um, you know, a lot of posts like we're always using latest, and well, it's it's not actually latest over there. I know it's not latest. What's happening? So, I'm going to be talking about this stuff like, um, okay, my pod is not running what I'm expecting. So let's do there. this way. Let's do pick one topic at a time okay. and start digging into it that what could potentially go wrong over there. Yes. And maybe touch on a topic and then we move on to the next mm -hmm. one. So the first one that you talked about is health checks. Mm -hmm. Tell us what is health check, first of all, in Kubernetes. So health checks in Kubernetes is a way to, um, well, check that your uh, container is, first of all, ready to accept traffic, and secondly, is, well, alive over there for you to use it. Uh, so this is a kind of a best practices if you're using microservices, the most popular architecture around now. So if you're a developer, for sure you have an endpoint or multiple endpoints for checking the health of your application. Um, so if you're making a, such an endpoint in your application, uh, then this has evolved also to the level of Kubernetes. And so I, as I understand, this is done using like health probes and live probes. Yes. And th that goes as part of your Kubernetes manifest itself. Yes, exactly. Right? Exactly. So tell us, what is it that can go wrong with that and where, where do customers get stuck with this? So what can go wrong with that is because, well, in the, for example, in Redness uh, probe, um, if you're having a dependency in your microservice and that dependency is not exactly managed by you and that one is taking a longer time to uh, to be to start or to uh, you know complete your readiness probe will uh, be failed i mean if you're not uh, juggling very well with the parameters of the readiness probe so this is about to uh, fine tune for your parameters for the probe in order to make sure that that dependency is not going to affect your life and this is kind of a real case situation because um, microservices, um, I mean, we might do microservices, but you know, the others uh, in the ecosystem that we're integrating with, maybe they have their legacy apps that are not responding in, in a timely manner, or maybe they have an outage. So it, these kind of situations can occur all the time, and it's not your fault, you do the right thing. You, you have, connect, you have uh, written the right stuff over there, but how do you address this? So how can you um, make sure that you're not failing before you're starting? Yeah, 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 so basically, uh, are you talking about a combination of a yes. health nation and a live probe over there or yes. or a fallback plan? What are you recommending to the customers over there? So I'm recommending um, um, some good practices. I'm also recommending a fallback plan sometimes. So Because uh, I think the best fallback plan is to observe in time, especially for uh, applications that are going to, that are production already. Um, you observe and you monitor your application's life even afterwards, because maybe in day one everything was perfect, but in day two, one of the others that you're integrating with has switched something in the API. I mean, this was, uh, it's just frequently seen, uh, switches in the API are frequently happening, and you're like, okay, what happened? It's not, and your customers, yeah. your users are using you. They don't know that you're using a third party, Correct. so you're blaming you first. Right, right, I understand. So I think that's a critical part of it that the customers have to understand on how to have these healthness probes and liveness probes work with each other and make sure it really works for so, them. So yes, it, so it, it starts and it's healthy. This is the most important part. Correct, correct. <laughs> First part, actually. Yeah, perfect. And then the next thing that you talked about is image replacement. Now, yep. 
as part of the Kubernetes manifest, you know, when you write down the manifest, the Docker image goes in there, so you put the image, well, the first, the typical design pattern that is recommended is don't use latest first of all. Eh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Isn't it? So that's the common anti-pattern that, that is recommended. So you're saying, yes, so the best practice is yes, don't use latest, but uh, there are the, um, the base images that, um, so for example, for even for Alpine and, and for all these base images that are well known for all of us, people just leave things open there. So they are using, it's latest, I'm trusting that, that image over there. It's provided by somebody whom I trust. So, so they think that latest means it has the latest one, has the CVEs, yes, patches, and security also, fixes. And also somebody, uh, so also um, what I've seen is the fact that a lot of people are like, why aren't we putting the image policy to always, all the time? It's like, no, it shouldn't be to always, all the time. This is not the right way. So there are other ways than putting the image policy to always. So what do you say as the image policy should be? Uh, the image policy should be, um, uh, the if not, um, if not available. If it's not available, um, then it, sh it should be the best one. Uh, and what that means is that if the image, image is, is not available, available on, so in a Kubernetes lingo, you have a worker node, on the worker node, if the image is not available, available. for that particular tag, then it will download, otherwise it will not download. Yeah. So uh, you're making sure that you're still having things uh, up there. Um, also, um, there's the pr pr problem like uh, I have gr I've, I've uh, modified the latest and the greatest, but I'm not running the latest and the greatest because yeah. I haven't triggered the recreation uh, of the pods. So how you do you retrigger that if you're not using, for example, if you're not using Helm? Uh, uh, sometimes. W when you're using Helm, you can uh, use the minus minus recreate pods, yeah. uh, which is very helpful. But if you're not using that and you're just going plain ahead with Kubernetes manifests and just want to keep it like that, you get have to have, have some other tricks um, in your sleeve. And that image policy is particularly important because in this case, what's really happening is, in a microservices world, you don't want to add to your runtime cost because otherwise the image is all, all, always downloaded that means that's going to add to your runtime cost. Yeah. But if the image already exists, just leverage that image as it is and then fire it up. Yeah, so cost is very important. Super important, <laughs> super important. Uh, talk about, you know, I think the next topic that you mentioned before we were talking is executing shell in the containers. Yeah, so um, another best practice in the industry are the entry points and, you know, specifying the entry point uh, shell script. Um, so sometimes uh, that one's, uh, some people think that, well, I'm writing this once and it's going to be never modified. Uh, but uh, surprises are there, like people are modifying that one and all the time people are looking to the Docker image and it's like, eh, it's the same thing. But it doesn't run the same thing, so what happens? So in this kind of situations, it's good to go and, and see what's inside that, um, that image, see if that entry point is actually corresponding to what you have coded and what you're expecting over there, and if, some, if some, something else was not introduced in the meantime. So this was, this was one of the practices. So I get a random image from somewhere, you know, <laughs> Docker Hub, ECR, whatever registry. How do I see in that image, what is the entry point? So you just simply go with kubectl exec minus it, and you're going to specify the pod uh, name, and then you go just go minus minus <laughs> slash bin slash uh, ch. This is the easiest way to go in that one. And afterwards, you just execute um, Linux commands that you are pretty much familiar with. Or if you are more, if you don't just go into that, you can directly execute the Linux command. So you can also execute uh, that uh, without the uh, slash bin slash ch. You can execute directly the, the Linux command that you are. Uh, if you want to see just the response for a specific command of what's running inside your pod. So, so far, the tips that you have talked about, those are specific to Kubernetes, they mm -hmm. run across different Kubernetes clusters. Yep. Depending upon, it doesn't really matter what storage provider, what cluster provider, what yep. service you're using. Talk to me about storage classes. Yeah. How, are they different in any sense? Yeah, storage classes, it's a very interesting topic. So. Um, I've realized that they def sometimes th that they differ from providers. So even though that you are l looking in the documentation, for example, and you're seeing some examples of storage um, of storage to be used for your volumes, if you look behind the scenes at the storage classes in the definition of a storage class, you'll see that there's a provider given, and that pertains to your cloud provider. So for example, if you're making a backup from from a cloud and you're exporting even those definitions, please pay very attention to uh, to that uh, to that provider that you're having over there. So that you might end up not 
end up with, with conflicts and, and not desired um, uh, stuff. Secondly, this is the default storage class because everyone has a default and <laughs> Uh, sometimes the default you're assuming that's over there, it's, uh, or it's you know local. It's not the default that's running a, into the managed cluster. So that's uh, that's one thing to be to pay a lot of attention. So default is not default for everyone. It's, it's a default for the cloud provider. For the cloud provider. Or like if you're running on a Minikube, for example, it could be completely different. So yes, you may be testing on Minikube and Kind on. K3S, whatever your Kubernetes distro is, but when you go into from dev to test to yeah, prod, I, I had that uh, could surprise <laughs> and seeing like, and I, you know, I was looking into that as I was looking with a colleague uh, because I shouted for help and <laughs> uh, and he was like, but you've done it well. It's I don't get it. What's wrong? What's wrong? And he was like, it's the default storage class. <laughs> I was like. Oh wow! Yeah. It's not well, the default is just like latest, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm running the default. It should work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, yeah, surprises. So these things are learned when you're practicing. You're right. just right. bumping your head into these. Talk to me about February 30th. <laughs> yeah. what, what is that concept? So February 30th is a way to stop your scheduled jobs that are not. Uh, you know, behaving as expected. So if you've made a mistake with the scheduled jobs, even though that's not a um, syntactic mistake, because nowadays we have ways to verify our syntax when we're using Kubernetes manifest. Um, if you, uh, I don't know, you're using the correct syntax, but uh, that correct syntax is uh, continuously generating for uh, pods that are terminating with failure, then you want to stop that creation. Um, and I'll showcase to you um, uh, about uh, the uh, February 30. So you can do that by patching your um, uh, job uh, to be scheduled for, fe to, for execution for February 30 because uh, I really hope that no calendar in this world, I don't know any <laughs> calendars, uh, I mean, I know only our normal calendar, but I don't think that February 30 is a valid date. So this and is I a hard stop for and that. And that's, I think, a calendar that, you know, both <laughs> Americans and non-Americans can agree upon, <laughs> as opposed to the date format, which we don't agree yeah, upon. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. So th that's <laughs> one uh, that's one trick that I, I, I like to, to do, like, okay, it's not doing the same thing, so I'm patching it with a... I think this is going to be an exciting talk. You know, I'm definitely looking forward to our recording of this when, are, when this talk is done. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the points that are given in the talk are relevant to Kubernetes clusters across different cloud providers or depending upon the environment that you're running at. So this will be definitely relevant. Any last bit that you want to add? Uh, well, um, I really hope for people in the audience to be engaged and ask me more because um, it's just 50 minutes. It's not enough for everything and for those that are experts, I encourage them to approach me and to ask me about more complicated stuff. I really don't want to, you know, to scare anyone with too deep concepts. So I'm trying to keep it up like open for uh, every audience so that you'll be able to uh, grasp the most important part over there. And I think that's always a tricky part you know, when you're giving a talk at a conference. You will always have people who have super deep experience and some super newbies. So it's difficult to please, but you know, I think you're doing a great job. And also there are people that are very attached to the way that they're doing things and they believe that that's the only best way to do things. That it takes some time to um, understand some other ways, some other things to do. And I want to go back to what Venkat was saying this morning in the keynote that yes, you are here to learn, but be willing to unlearn if that is not the right approach. Yeah. What I love about DevOps is the fact that even though that I might be aware of certain things, it's always to be good to be reminded about the best practices. It's good to have a refresh from yeah. time to time. Thank you, Anna Maria. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, Arun. Same here. All right, thank you. This is Arun Gupta signing off from here. Bye-bye. <laughs>